Thank you very much. So first of all, I have a question. Uh, have you already seen a piece by Castellucci before or not? Who has? No, okay. So it makes things more complicated, but it will be okay. I have some images. I also have to apologize for my French and Russian accent. It's a very awful mix, actually. So if you don't understand anything, just wave at me and I will try to repeat this. The god whose oracle is at Delphi neither speaks plainly nor conceals, but indicates by signs. This 93rd fragment of Heraclitus brings us to a core of a problem. Since the ancient Greece, our fate, our tragedy, so to say, is that the gods provoke men. And they provoke men for a very simple reason. They cause men to get out of balance. Why for? Not at all because it's a matter of revenge, but because the oracle can never be understood at once. The oracle, by nature, is oblique. It says something that man cannot understand immediately. This is why the riddle of the oracle is always the enigma of time. This is pure time, and this is the revenge of time. So when Oedipus is confronted to his own destiny, remember, he does not understand it all of a sudden. He can only understand that later. And this irony of Greek gods can be found in another great outcome of European literature, we just spoke about that, namely Macbeth, where the obscure forces represented by the three witches tell the king his destiny, but in a such obscure way that he falls into the trap. He doesn't believe them. They tell him he can be quiet until the forest walks, but he cannot interpret this sign. Not only because the fate is formulated obscurely, it's literally the trap of gods, the revenge of time. There is a riddle to be solved that gives us the task to be performed. So what is a sign? According to the fragment of Heraclitus, meaning does never arrive all prepared and ready to the one who seeks it. And yet, it does not remain hidden, nor it is deliberately, deliberately, sorry, elusive. The meaning does not spring all of a sudden, sparing us the need for search, but it is not inexistent. It does not confine our lives to absurdity. On the contrary, the movement of sense is subtle. It is revealed, it is being shown through signs in the heart of life, the deity gives us signs. So the whole question lies in those signs. With them, in short, nothing is immediate and nothing is out of reach. Everything is there, but everything is in a shadow, or filigrane, like Deleuze said it once. Implicit, so to say. So my talk today aims to attempt a very simple demonstration that the work of Romeo Castellucci, the Italian theater director, the founder of the Società Raffaello Sanzio, who has been innovating what theatre means for us for more than 20 years, so to demonstrate that his work is entirely driven by that enigma of science. The work of Castellucci not only interprets and not only ends science to be interpreted, it produces them by determinable procedures. So what are they? Uh, how do they work? That's my question today. Elements on stage are only important in as much as they give out signs for decipherment over a more or less deep-seated rhythm of time. So a bull on stage, a terrifying technological device, a baby playing in a huge golden room, a crowd endlessly walking towards the audience. The value of each scene is based only upon what they impart on us. So signs as we know, were also the main concern for, of Deleuze insofar as they mobilized the problem of the relation of sensibility and thought. What forces us to think is the sign. The sign is the object of an encounter, but it is precisely the contingency of the encounter that guarantees the necessity of what it leads us to think. So I'm, I'm constrained in my thinking. I think in, in front of every great work of art, I do not think what I want to think. And precisely, this is the aim of art. So we need something that does violence to thought, which rests us, 
it in, from its natural stupor and its merely abstract possibilities. So to think is always to interpret, to explicate, to develop, to decipher, to translate the sign. There is no more an explicit signification than a clear idea. There are only meanings implicated in signs, and if thought has the power to explicate the sign, to develop it in an idea, this is because the idea is already there in the sign, in the enveloped and involuted state, in the obscure state of what forces us to think. But so, of course, the essential qualities of the sign, and the sign is always sensuous, it's, it's sensible reality, it's a phenomenon, of course. So there is a trap there, a kind of danger, this kind of tendency of intelligence to refer the sign to the object that emits it, to attribute to the object the benefit of the sign. This is what Deleuze calls in Christian science the error of objectivism, so to say, as if the sign was merely indexical or referential. Actually, there is a kind of reference, but the reference is not to the object as such, but to an idea, a kind of problem which arises there. This is the whole difference in repetition, actually, the strength of the idea. And so to be sensitive to science, to consider the world as an object to be deciphered, is doubtless a gift. And this is why I think Oedipus and Macbeth are unable of that release. This is why they are doomed. They, they do not develop this quality, this sensuous impression, like a tiny Japanese paper that opens underwater and releases the captive forms, says Deleuze in Proust in Science. So we recognize things, they recognize things, but they do not know them, they do not think them yet. They merely identify signs with a kind of information, with a kind of communication. So beyond designated objects, beyond intelligible and formulated truth, but also beyond subjective chains of associations, are the essences or the ideas that are a-logical or supra-logical. They transcend the states of subjectivity no less than the properties of the object. It is the essence that constitutes the sign insofar as it is irreducible to the object emitting it. So the intensive theory of signs in Deleuze links the ideal synthesis of difference and the asymmetric synthesis of the sensible, the two central chapters in difference and repetition. So the two parts of the system, the actual and the virtual, the figuration of a sign of a sign, sorry, is hence like a lightning. It is within the actual, it has physical properties, it is a phenomenon, an event, and yet the imperishable, the impassive part of the virtual, the problem or of the idea, continue to insist, to persist beyond actualization. So now let's finally go to Castellucci in order to show how signs are the only and the genuine elements of his theatre. It's a kind of energetical theater, so to say, of signalization. It's not a theater of meaning or of representation anymore, but a theater of forces, of intensities, of drives. And intensity, energia, is really what configures the sensation on the one hand and what illuminates or points towards the idea on the other hand. So the idea in Castellucci, I think, really makes the sensation meaningful, while the sensation in its own turn expresses the idea. Or, in other words, the problematic, the idea, has to be dramatized by specific sensations, specific scenic devices, in order for it to be expressed in real sensations. So here I show you some images. This is Schwan and Gizan, seen in Brussels, I think, two years ago. So, as you can see, a pure theater of forms, actually. What, why the woman cries, it doesn't matter anymore. It's all about like a kind of suffering of individuation. Because the woman goes through different stages, different states, even monstrous states, just before the sequence. And then she gathers, so to say, all together, her body and her mind, with the whole stage coming to the central point around her. But it's a purely impressive 
uh, impact, so to say, on, on the audience. It's purely a question of forms leading to her. So what matters, I think, for Castellucci is really breaking with the reality principle, interrupting the real. This is the important thing for theatre. If it's about going to a hell of a mouth, a hell mouth, it's about going into the hell of the real. The inferno in Castellucci belongs to the real. Because the darkness of the idea uh, is that it's real without being actual. So this is possible with an experience of form. The theater of Castellucci is only a theater of form. You might find a ready-made form, or you may have to construct the form. Nor is it a question of a particular artist's style. It's more like an explosion, something that detonates across every dimension and touches everyone without distinction. So the form is inalienable, like something stopped in time, and in the sense, it's about reawakening the form. Maybe the true beast on the stage is the form. And so the material, the surface that is chosen each time, is a kind of conductor of the form. It is not yet the form itself. On no occasion is it possible to say the form is this. Nor is the form the symbol. It's even more primitive if such a thing is possible. And this is impossible, of course, with a mere symbol, but with a form or with a sign, with a very specific image, I think it becomes possible. And this is all the, the work of Castellucci, is to work on very specific types of images. For instance, the combination of light and gold, this is a form. Or marble, hunger, thirst, these are forms. Darkness is a form, or hardness. The circle, the cube, these are forms. There are things that make up part of our life every day, but here they appear as signs, precisely. Not to be recognized, not to be interpreted, but to be experienced. So the only truth we have to offer is a form. A surface tension, a body like an epidermis, which must be more or less tense, almost like a mathematical structure of a musical instrument. So it's not a poetic energy that's going on here. Uh, it's not a textual or political energy. It's really a physical energy provoked not by the spirit, by, but by the spirits, by the phantoms that gather and thicken on every stage. So the images are diluted as soon as they have appeared. There are a kind of pulsations always in Castellucci. It's a very fragmented theater. One image calls another, which will call another one, and so on. So it's, there is no narrative, of, or if there is a narrative, it's always fragmented, exploded. So it's, it is genuinely a theater of matter, form, of material, constantly running away, permanently changing. The forms are rather abstract, as I said, triangles, squares, or even if you have identifiable human figures, it's very simple a policeman, a little girl crying, a cleaning lady. But because of their radical simplicity, they are experienced as a surprise and manage to create upon viewers an emotive tension. So, of course, you will recognize here the great influence of uh, Arthur, the theater of cruelty. Namely, we have to get over mimesis and the triadic unity it establishes, namely totality, illusion, and representation of the world. And so the new rules for theatre would be to destroy the submission of theatre to text, that is to say, to take the text as one element among many others on the stage. What can they be? Lightning, actors, uh, sounds, and so on. Uh, figures, shapes, I don't know. So first thing, to destroy the submission of features to the text. Secondly, to create material images. This is why it's really like a materialistic theater. And finally, to make out of actors and the props themselves genuine hieroglyphs, namely signs. So it's really about, I think in Castellucci, destroying 
abolishing representation. Hence, in Castellucci, there is always this very subtle and never resoluted tension between iconoclasm and iconography. Uh, so what does it mean? Of course, we have to avoid the annoying necessity of storytelling. But the problem is that, and it's really a delusion problem, there are already two main images. Images are seductive, they seduce us. So they are bad, but not in a moral sense of this world. It's not a political, it's not an ethical future. They are bad because they do not force us to think. They do not put our faculties to their own limits. Only a certain type of science can do that, can achieve this task of art. So the diminution of images actually will be uh, positive because it, it creates a kind of opposition to this kind of white noise of everyday images, of communication. So the role of art, the role of theater in Castellucci, is always a kind of interruption of reality. It's not about reproducing the world, but producing as it has never been seen before. And we have to make this process visible. This is the most complicated thing. And here lies the tension. So when I say iconoclasm, it's not the iconic, it's not the absence of icons, not a iconic. It's the destruction of icons. So if you pay attention to what I say, iconoclasm is always figurative. So we have two dimensions, iconography and iconoclasm. And the artist has to have the courage to break images he himself created. This is, I think, the core of the work of Castellucci. Beautiful, yet perfect, among the best images, are destructed before anyone else does it. So there is the highest possible tension there between creation and destruction. And so it also, of course, refers to the whole struggle in Deleuze of images against cliches, because precisely the highest power today, it's not the church, it's not the state, but it's the power of communication, like empty, poor images, and the very sort of technology which that goes with that. So the sign can, be not, can never be informative in that sense. It's never journalistic. It's not a marketing image. Because the images you can see can seem like very beautiful, but it's not beauty in a, in, a, in a common sense of the word, because that would be only communication, I think, really. There is a kind of terror, so to say, in Deleuze and in Castellucci of plenitude, when everything is given at once. In sign, nothing is given at once, precisely. This is why they have to be deciphered, interpreted. So there is, I think, a strong awareness of a necessary, necessary struggle against the sister-in-law of science, namely cliches, presenting the, the real as publicity. So there is a great power which has to be distracted there in order to turn out the cliché, uh, the image, sorry, out of cliches. This is Francis Bacon, Logic of Sensation, and so on. But so when I was speaking about the theatre of energy or a theater of intensity, what I wanted to say is that theater for Castellucci is always a kind of pilgrimage within matter, the ultimate reality. It's the theater of smallest elements possible, a sound, a figure, a color, a rhythm. I have some examples here, it's from his notebook, and then most of the images were actually created on stage. So very simple description, very fragmented description of what a play could be once. Yeah. So it's really a feature linked to matter and the fear of matter. And the matter is obscure, of course. And so to dive into it is to ask very simple kind of questions. What is a gesture? What noise does one make on stage when he walks? What does it say about his weight? So these are new kinds of problems with regard to dramaturgy and that arise out of those questions. But so the point is always to snatch out of the real the supremacy of experience. In order to do what? In a very delusional way, actually. In order to put our faculties in front of their own limits. 
that is to say, to put violence upon thought and to make us think what a cliche can never do because I already recognize something. So, because I literally hate this kind of uh, intellectual, political, uh, cultural theater. When I go to the play and I see, okay, I recognize my studies, I recognize my Shakespeare, and everything is right. There is really a kind of frustration on the part of the spectator, kind of disturbance, which is necessary, I think. And I think the spectator really feels extremely uncomfortable in front of, uh, of, this, of this art. So I have one minute left. Okay, so maybe to conclude, what I wanted to say is that there is always a dimension of risk uh, present in Castellucci and actually to generalize in every artistic work. It's a kind of journey into the unknown, hence the title of, of this presentation. And this unknown is precisely the obscurity of the sign, the obscurity of form. And there is no given map to orient ourselves over there. So it's like almost a manipulating a radioactive, a dangerous element. And all authentic art, of course, is dangerous and risky. Otherwise, it becomes merely decorative or illusionistic or I don't know what. So the, the point is really always to make the gaze problematic. It's, every sign is almost like a black hole, you know, because the black hole makes the light bind. And so our gaze in front of Castellucci are bound as well. It's never a direct gaze of recognition. It's a kind of erotical gaze, precisely because the idea, obscure, although distinct, is always there. It is being expressed in sensuous material forms. So this was my, my conclusion. Thank you very much. <laughs> Simplicity. Radical simplicity. Yeah. It's in your head. Yeah. Um, I've seen many of his performances that I'm uh, speaking from the position of the musician because I'm. Okay. And I found when I interpret his work extremely complex. Of course. So uh, I was a bit astonished about your saying radical simplicity. For me, it's extremely complex because when I in all these pictures of the trends and you sit there for two hours, mm -hmm. especially when you think about music mm -hmm. uh, and an ensemble playing a loop into a score, so many little threads and subtleties and recognitions yeah. and repetitions and false repetitions in it, which when I interpret that makes his work for me uh, very complicated. Of possible. course, yeah. Uh, and, uh, so I have really performed to work, not sitting in an audience just enjoying the show, but really to work to bring these complex structures and little notes and mm -hmm. uh, inserts and excerpts in my mind together. So I was a bit astonished about your relevant yeah. simplicity. Yeah, yeah, of course. So unfortunately you have missed the main part of the talk because which was like the theoretical part here i was only illustrating what i've said before and all my talk was uh, constructed around this idea of a sign so a sign a sign not signs sign and the sign has precisely this intermediary reality so to say it's simple on the it's simple on the one hand on the within the dimension of the, of the form, of, of the matter, of sensual quality. But the sign is always the expression of something else. We can maybe go back to this. And I think the complexity arises over there. So it's the whole delusion problem, actually. The relation of sensibility and thought, of sense and thinking. 
So, of course, the teacher of Castellucci is immensely complicated. It's one of the most complicated teachers I, can, I have ever experienced. But as such, the images that are presented to me are extremely simple, I think. It's really, it's a question of rhythm, really. So when the light flashes suddenly on the stage and when I wasn't prepared to that, it's really a physical contact with the audience, the minimal physical contact. Because the flash of light, just, it's painful for me. It's painful for my eyes who were accustomed to this kind of darkness in the audience, you see? So in that sense, it's very simple. But then it's a provocation for thought. It's a violence for thought. And then the spirit is engaged it's put into task to interpret precisely, to decipher those. So this is the whole relation, so to say, of the actual and the virtual. The virtual resists, it persists under the sensual qualities, beyond them. So yeah, I don't know if I'm clear enough when I... I yeah, so have I answered your question or not? No, no, it's, it's clear. Thank you for your answer. Okay. I no, 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 no problem, but it's, this is very important, yeah, because I'm, uh, like, my point was absolutely not to say that it's a simple teacher. I think it works with the simplest form possible, but they are always complicated because they are always open. It's like a con constellation of images working together. It's almost like montage in cinema. So one simple image put to a next simple image creates an immensely complex reality. Just like in music, for instance. For me, it helps to see it as a score, as a musical score. Yeah, a score is a good idea as well, yeah. But it's a mathematical relations. It's exactly like in Proust, I was quoting Proust here as well. When he, he hears the ritornello, of course, I mean, it's sounds, it's physics. But no, what he, like, the sign is precisely to this kind of mathematical perfection, to the essence, or something like that, to the idea, to the problem of every great uh, conductor, of every great composer, which is not reducible to, to sensible qualities, I think. There are lots of different possibilities. There are no recipe, there are no rules. It's just that text is just one element among another. So I think, for instance, it can be just a kind of swallowed and then vomited up again on the stage by actors. But it's not a kind of expressive discourse. It's not something they have to say. It's almost text reduced to its uh, physical expression actually, almost like music again, or just like a sound among any other sound. So he's not against the narration. I think it would be very like stupid reaction. It's, it's very oppositional, I think. He's not a provocative uh, artist, not at all. But he says that I'm looking for a kind of scandal. And scandal in Greek, like scandalon, is this little rock on the floor which makes you fall, you know, which makes you disturbed. So I think the work on this text, on, on text, is within this kind of framework. So it's never, yeah, it's never storytelling. Because he al also did some uh, opera stages, for instance. And for opera it's very complicated, because the text is given, but not only the text, but also the temporality of the text. Everything is there. But even there, when he stages them, he did like Parsifal, he did... Uh, Orphée and Eurydice, and now he just did uh, Moses and Aaron by Schoenberg in Paris. And um, it's a completely new opera. It's an opera like we have never seen it before, really. Because the text is not more important than music, than lightning, than other kind of sounds. And even, I think, the emotions of the spectators become part of this theater, is one element among any others. So you're not in this passive condition of listening and uh, interpreting what is being said on stage. But he works with very classical figures, Macbeth, 
Hamlet, uh, Julius Caesar, stuff like that. But those forms, even those forms, are only like emblems, like parables, and nothing more. Thank you very much.